Okay, good evening everybody and welcome to the fourth talk in our Farming for the Future series, um, which we are uh, doing in partnership with Chelsea Green Publishing. Um, so this is a series of books where uh, we, we interview um, various Chelsea Green food and farming authors to get their take on the future of farming. So my name is Caroline Aitken and I'm the Programme Development Lead for the Food and Farming courses at Schumacher College, including uh, our brand new BSc in Regenerative Food and Farming, which is the first degree of its kind in the country. And if you'd like to know more about that, you can find out more on our website. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our author this evening, um, who is Nicolette Hahn Nyman, um, who was an environmental lawyer, is an environmental lawyer, turned cattle rancher in the USA, and she has recently um, uh, brought out a renewed edition of her book, Defending Beef, the Ecological and Nutritional Case for Meat. So we're going to be speaking this evening about that and uh, all other things that she's involved with. And just before we start the, um, the presentation and the talk, the discussion, um, just to let you know uh, as attendees that you can um, post any questions that you may have as we go through the session uh, in the Q&A section. So at the bottom of your screen you should have um, a horizontal menu and you'll see that there's a one with a couple of speech bubbles that says Q&A. So that's where you need to post your questions and we will get to those as we can throughout the session. So hi Nicolette, welcome. Hello, thank you. Very strange to be talking from my own kitchen, but <laughs> these are unusual times, aren't they? <laughs> so so I, I'm planning on um, giving a presentation for about 15 to 20 minutes, kind of just quickly reviewing the basic theses of uh, my book, Defend Beef, and then and just kind of my work that I've been doing for the last 20 years on environment and agriculture and livestock. Um, production specifically. And I'm going to focus on three uh, main topics. And there's a great deal more detail in in my writings. And Caroline and I will be um, talking after doing a, a conversation about these things. And then there will be Q&A. So we'll have, we'll get to expand on these topics, but I'm going to give kind of a broad overview of three main points that I want to stress. And um, I'm going to um, show some slides as I'm speaking, and then we'll take those off after um, after I give this presentation. We'll see if I can pull this up now. Let's see what that, can you see my presentation now? Is okay. it there? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so um, the, my focus is about the role of the animals and the importance of the animals. And there's been so much uh, discussion in recent years about animals and agriculture, but almost entirely the negative aspects. So what I'm arguing is that um, animals are actually essential for a healthy and ecologically vibrant food system, and that they're incredibly important for optimal human health as well. So uh, very often in um, modern parlance, we get this kind of um, uh, comparison between cars and cattle, cow cows and cars. And I actually gave a talk um, a couple months ago to a fifth and sixth, uh, fifth and fourth grade class, and I was, I asked them what's the similarity between cows and cattle, or cows and co cows and cars. And uh, <laughs> one of the kids raised his hand and said they both start with the letter C. <laughs> and I said that's absolutely brilliant because that's exactly the right answer. <laughs> and I don't think in a group of adults would have gotten that answer. <laughs> but what we're told very often in the sort of um, you know, mainstream media, especially, is that these things are equivalent, and that, um, it's, especially with respect to global warming, that we have to be equally worried about having cattle on the landscape as we are about how much driving we're doing, especially for climate change. And there have been lots of, um, you know, headlines about how um, climate change is being caused and really aggravated by meat, and that we should all go vegan. And here's one from The Guardian that you're all undoubtedly familiar with. But the primary message that I have is that um, this is a gross oversimplification. And I love this quote from the American uh, journalist, H.L. Mencken, for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. And in my view, 
veganism for climate change is a clear, simple, and wrong solution. Even if massive numbers of humans went vegan, it would have minimal to possibly no impact on climate change. And I, I believe it would actually have a negative impact on both the environment and human health. So it's absolutely the wrong solution. I wanna talk a little bit about what I think, why I think that's such a wrong uh, approach and what I think the right approach is. So I just wanna show a few quick slides about the complexity of nature. We, we know that a car is, uh, you know, a kind of, is a human built machine. And it, you can think of it in very linear terms, in terms of its input and in terms of its outputs. What are its impacts on the environment? Um, but nature doesn't work like that. And animals in nature don't work like that. So cattle or cows, when they're in nature, they're part of all of these complex cycles. And one of these is the nutrient cycle. Another is the water cycle. And I'm not going to go through the detail of these slides, but these just show some of the complexity of all of the things that impact these uh, these issues. And most importantly, the soil food web, where you have all kinds of uh, fungi and plants and animals working together and having multiple and complex interactions and impacts on one another. And so the sort of that brings me back to this slide about cows equaling cars? And my answer is no, not at all. They do not equal each other. So let's just forget that idea and let's look a little more specifically at three main to topics, methane, water, and soil. There's much more to say about many other aspects, but I want to focus on these three main points. Um, I wrote a piece for the New York Times in 2009, which they called the carnivore's dilemma, where I talked about greenhouse gases and its connection to livestock. And I talked about all three um, of the major gases, carbon, nitrous oxide, and methane. In the US, all of agriculture causes between eight to 10% of greenhouse gases. And, um, of that, I'm going to talk more specifically a moment about this, but livestock is just a portion of that. One of the main, uh, agri you know, gas uh, greenhouse gases in general, but included in um, in ag from agriculture, is carbon dioxide, and that's. Um, mostly from transportation, automation, and harvesting systems. And actually, agriculture's connection to carbon dioxide is not, uh, not that strong. So it's not really a major problem. It's something we need to think about, but it is not the primary concern. Nitrous oxide is probably of greater concern. And I remember um, I attended um, an event in Canada a couple of years ago, and there was some really dramatic um, uh, data that I saw in Canada at that time about um, showing the dramatic rise in nitrous oxide emissions related to crop production. And in the US, um, UC Davis, which is our primary um, agricultural school in California and one of the most important agricultural schools in the US, had shown that um, about 40% of that nitrous oxide from agriculture is from fertilized crops. And I just um, interestingly saw a study just yesterday about how um, commercial fertilizers um, are a dramatic uh, contributor to methane as well and far greater than was previously estimated. Um, but I want to go back, step back just a second, and then I'm going to talk more specifically about methane, which is the third major um, global warming gas. So globally, the, the probably the most reliable estimate of the livestock contribution is about 14.5%. Food and Agriculture Organization's number from 2013. It um, hasn't changed much since then, and that was probably their most comprehensive review. But it's important to note that in that, that number, they acknowledged that they did not reduce, they did not consider any of the mitigation that, um, that livestock causes. So in other words, especially carbon sequestration, which is increasingly being shown to um, result from well-managed livestock was not considered in that number. So their own um, report acknowledged that that number could be far less or even nothing if carbon the full impact of carbon sequestration was considered. In the US, all domesticated ruminants, so that includes not just cattle, but sheep and goats and yaks and everything else that people are raising domestically, 
are just two to 3% of our greenhouse gases. And if you were to eliminate all farm animals, according to a study that was published in 2017 in the proceedings of uh, the National Academy of Sciences, it would only reduce US greenhouse gas emissions by 2.6%. But there's a huge amount of uh, potential for mitigation of greenhouse gases from, from agriculture and especially from grasslands. And again, this Food and Agriculture Report of 2013 acknowledged that when it said grassland carbon sequestration could significantly offset emissions. Now let's look at methane for a moment specifically because that's gotten so much attention, especially with respect to cattle. When you talk about cattle, um, farming, there are two main sources of methane. One is from the manure and one is from the enteric fermentation. But I always want to step back for a second and think about methane levels from a long-term perspective and um, think about, consider the amount of methane that was emitted by the prehistoric herds and subsequent herds of uh, wild ruminant animals that were on the globe. Pennsylvania State University has estimated that the pre-settlement levels of ruminant emissions in the United States, in North America actually, were equal to or greater than the current levels from domesticated animals. And I think that's an important point because people tend to um, have in their minds um, a kind of a graph that there's this rising level of methane that's been going on, you know, for millions of years, and it's being dramatically increased by by the presence of modern domesticated animals. And in fact, there's there are fluctuations, and we have had um, higher levels of methane from wild animals in the past, and now the domesticated ruminants are largely replacing those uh, disappeared wild animals. There's also an important point about um, just sort of mis misattribution of methane emissions. Um, again, in the US, Dr. Robert Howarth at Cornell University, who had something called the Methane Project, has argued that fracking is the most important um, issue in the United States with respect to um, with respect to methane emissions. And he specifically says that some of the methane emissions that have been previously attributed to cattle in the United States. Are, are wrongly attributed. And he bases this on satellite data um, where he says that actually the, there's no um, scientific basis for connecting the cattle uh, herds with me methane emissions. And that actually these, um, the methane that has previously been attributed to cattle in the US is actually from fracking. Um, in the UK, Dr. Miles Allen, that I'm sure many of you are familiar with at Oxford, who has been very involved in methane as well, he has said that the current conventional method for, method for accounting for methane emissions is all wrong. And I had the, um, the opportunity to speak directly with Dr. Allen when I attended the Sustainable Food Trust Conference in July of 2019. And he told me, in fact, that he was very frustrated about the fact that cattle are so pre prevalent in this conversation about methane because he said, it's so clear that it's really all about fossil fuels. And um, I can speak more about that in questions or in the conversation. Um, Dr. Frank Mitloner at UC Davis, again, here in the United States, has um, made the argument that the methane um, from agriculture and from ruminant animals should really be considered in a totally different way than, than that from fo the fossil fuel industry. And he says, this is not new carbon, it's recycled carbon. When you're talking about any kind of carbon, methane, of course, being um, having uh, carbon in it. So he's referring to, he was talking about methane specifically. Um, it's part of a natural cycle and it is very different in terms of its overall impact than um, carbon that was deeply sequestered in the earth and extracted through processes like fracking and oil, um, oil drilling. And so he argues that we should um, have a totally different conversation when we're talking about cattle. Um, it's also important to note that methane um, is partially offset by the soil dwelling organisms that live in the soil, the methanotropes or methane oxidizing bacteria, MOBs. And some work has been done on this by Dr. Mark Adams at Sydney University in Australia and Dr. Ed Bork in, um, in Canada at University of Alberta. And their work has 
shown that where you have well-managed systems, well-managed agricultural systems, you have a healthy population of soil uh, dwelling um, organisms of all types. And in particular, you have higher levels of methane oxidizing bacteria in those soils, and they can largely offset, not fully probably, but they can have uh, an offsetting impact on methane that comes from ruminant animals. Um, also, there's been um, very important research happening around the world on mitigation of methane from cattle and, or, and other domesticated ruminant animals. And an example of this has been um, what has been done in the rice industry where um, pro, you know, techniques were changed and there was a dramatic reduction, although some people dispute this, but in general, it's agreed that there has been a pretty dramatic reduction in uh, the methane from the rice industry. The methane from rice industry was actually the number one um, most, um, the, the highest source of um, anthropogenic methane in the 1980s, according to some sources. And that has been pretty dramatically reduced by changing the techniques. And the same thing is happening in the cattle industry. So um, better um, grazing has been shown to have an impact. Seaweed has been shown to have a pretty dramatic impact if it's added to feed. Um, dung beetle populations reduce methane. Ruminants, um, rumen um, weights have even been shown to have um, to cause reduced methane. All kinds of very interesting things that are being looked at that have been shown to reduce methane from cattle. So the message with methane is, first of all, the, uh, the issue is dramatically misunderstood right now. And there are really important things that are being shown to reduce or eliminate methane in agricultural systems. And uh, it's simply not an intract intractable problem, which is, I think, the message we often hear from the vegan community. But that's completely, in my view, not scientifically warranted. Um, here's one of the studies, I just included it because it's from the UK, about methane reduction from seaweed being added to feed. And I'm not, I'm not convinced this is something everybody should be doing, but it's the kind of thing that's happening at agricultural universities around the world to, um, to figure out how to mitigate methane. And there are some pretty effective things that are happening, including seaweed. Um, I want to take just a step back for a second. I mentioned that there were high levels of ruminant um, animals in the past and high amounts of methane coming from those ruminant animals. And I just want to sort of put a little more um, meat on the bones of that idea. Um, in, we had uh, about 66 million years ago, the dinosaurs disappeared and about 60 million years ago, there was uh, the emergence of grasses as a major ecosystem type on the planet. And about 40 million years ago, you began, you began to have the presence of widespread grassland ecosystems. And with that, you had huge herds of herbivores, especially ruminants around the globe in these open areas. And the animals, it's a kind of a co-evolutionary process where the animals create and maintain the grassland ecosystems. And then they're also, you know, they're also necessary in order to keep those grassland ecosystems in existence. Um, over the last 100,000 years, we've had a dramatic reduction in the wild um, large mammals, both be due, again, sort of disputed among scientists, which is a greater factor, but due to climate changes and um, over hunting by humans. So just a couple, I just want to show a couple of quick slides. This is a, an artist's rendition of a shrub ox, which is a prehistoric animal. And the reason I include this is because I've had um, people sort of challenge me on the idea that there were animals having an impact on the globe in prehistoric times that were, you know, because you didn't have domesticated cattle. And actually there were several um, prehistoric animals that, including in the North America, that were very similar to cattle. And here's one of them, the shrub ox, and here's the woodland musk, musk ox, which also looks very much like cattle nowadays and probably had a similar ecological impact. So um, we just have a few sort of remaining remnants of these massive wild herds that once covered much of the globe. And here's a picture of one of that. Um, that's the the caribou and the Arctic. Um, and this is the Cape Buffalo in, um, in the Serengeti, I believe. And this is in the um, upper Midwest um, or the Great Plains of the United States. And these are bison, which of course were once extremely numerous and now are in very small numbers. But you can see um, how they function. They're very dense, large herds and they move as a herd and they have tremendous ecological impact when they do that. Um, what is it about, I want, now going back to um, domesticated livestock for a moment. 
uh, it's very important to understand that livestock creates unique advantages for humans because they are portable, unlike crop production, and they can function as a kind of a savings account for people that are in agriculture and food production because you can reduce the size of your herd, you can increase the size of your herd, you can slaughter when you need to, and you can move them. And so there, it's very different from crop production and therefore it plays an incredibly important and unique role around the world, especially for subsistence peoples. And um, when we talk about this idea that you know we should get rid of meat and get rid of livestock, we're talking about getting rid of something that is incredibly unique in the food system. And in my, again, I believe it's a really unwise suggestion that we could remove them partly because of these attributes. Also, again, not, not talked about very often, but living alongside animals has been shown all over the world to provide health benefits for the people that are living alongside their livestock in terms of um, enhanced immunity. And most importantly, so I have this kind of separated off that, that fourth point, um, they are um, able to exist on non-farmable land. And about, as Dr. Lynn Hunsinger of Berkeley University Biology Department says, about half of the Earth's land surface is non-farmable. So if you get rid of the animals, especially the grazing animals, you take all of that land out of um, potential food production for humans, which, which I do not think that the Earth could bear as far as sustaining the human population. So let's talk about, um, I've talked about methane. I want, the second issue I wanna talk about is water and this, and first the water quantity, and then I'm gonna say a word about quality. Um, the quantity we're often heard, we're often told that the water um, that is used to produce uh, livestock, but especially beef is far too much water. And there's a figure that's been flying around for a long time saying about 1800 gallons of water is required to produce a pound of beef. But this is actually a very um, misleading figure, which is based on all of the water that the animals are consuming, including all of the water that's in the grass that they consume. So in other words, it's taking the water that falls from the sky naturally on the vegetation natu that's naturally occurring, and then they're consuming it. And that is in that 1800 gallons number, which is why it's so high. If you don't do it that way, and again, the UC Davis, um, department um, at the at the agricultural school there did a very thorough analysis a few years ago about how a typical pound of beef is produced and they found that even when it is grain finished so it's not a grass-fed um, beef it's just sort of standard conventional American beef actually takes about 440 gallons of um, per pound that's still fairly water intensive, but it is very much in line with a lot of other foods that are very common, such as rice. It's almost exactly the same amount as it takes to produce a pound of rice. Now, if you, um, if you look specifically at grass-fed beef, the number is even quite a bit lower, according to some estimates. And it's closer to about 120 gallons of water per pound, which is so even about a, less than a third of the figure for, gra for grain finished. The most important point is that about 97% of the water that is used for beef is green water. It's the water that's contained in the vegetation. And so those figures that you see everywhere that sound incredibly exorbitant as far as water production, water use are very misleading. And where you have good grazing, you actually have far more water in the soil. The, um, the United States, uh, the NRCS, which is the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service in the US, the part of the federal government, has calculated that every 1% of additional organic matter leads to 25,000 additional gallons of water per hectare. So that that is um, that shows that where you have um, good management of the agriculture and especially grazing because you're not um, breaking open the protective vegetation of the soil when you're doing grazing, you actually get a lot more water in the soil. So when you look at all of this sort of big picture thinking about water, water quantity is not really a very strong argument against beef. And in fact, water quality is a strong argument for beef and for the grazing animals because wherever you have a well-maintained grass cover, which you do when you have well-managed grazing, you have far less sediment. And there, these are a couple of studies. Um, again, I have all the citations in my writings, but um, 
these are from very good, credible studies that were done. And one of them showed that you have about 80% less sediment running off from land where you have a well-maintained uh, grazing area. And you have about 40% um, less uh, nutrient runoff in those areas. Um, now, I just want to say uh, about the whole concept of grass and this protective covering. I just mentioned how it protects water. The other really important thing that it does is that it protects the soil where you have a well-maintained vegetative cover. And as you have this well-maintained cover, you're building carbon and fertility. And wherever you have um, areas that are allowed to go into um, pasture periodically in a rotational system, you will have fewer weeds and fewer pests. And of course you have tremendous um, habitat and food provided for wild animals like birds and bees, but also many, many others, and especially most importantly, perhaps the insects. Um, so this is this overall um, protection is provided by the grass. And what's happening underground is extremely important. Um, this is just a picture, it doesn't, uh, the, the roots actually go much further down, but it shows how you have this tiny filament that's happening there underground. And that's incredibly important because that's creating a lot of surface area where there's an interaction between the plant and the soil. And in the photo on the right, which is the, the sort of um, bright green, that's actually a photograph taken by the Department of Agriculture in the US showing the honey-like coating that covers the grass roots, and that's a substance called glomalin, which was just identified by the USDA about 20 years ago, and that is now known to be incredibly important in regulating the interactions between the plant and the soil, and that is how the soil gets put into the, um, the carbon gets put into the soil by the plant, and um, the uh, the soil gives the plant the nutrients there are, that it needs to grow. So there are exchanges continually happening. And wherever you have a growing plant, a protective vegetative cover, you will have these interactions. And that's why having that protective um, grassland or other pasture or um, vegetative cover is so important. And that's why the grazing animals are so important in food systems. Um, I don't want to take too much more time, so I'm just going to quickly go over the next slides. This is um, some of the specific research that has been done on carbon sequestration, showing that where you have well-managed grazing, you can actually have carbon neutrality or even carbon negative production of food. And this is an important, very important essay that was put together um, in 2016 by some of the leading rangeland scientists and sustainability scientists in the US. And they argued that if you took uh, areas out of um, crop production in the United States and put it into pasture or rangeland, you would actually um, have a better ecological impact as far as climate change because you get so much more carbon sequestration. So kind of flipping the whole argument about ruminants and climate change on its head. Um, I just want to quickly add that um, I'm not going to, we can talk about this more in the questions or in the discussion, but um, beef and other um, ruminants provide very extremely and uniquely nutritious food. Um, it's not just protein and K2, iron, zinc, B12, and other vitamins. It is specifically um, each of those things in a form that the human body is very well able to use and actually much better able to use than alternatives. And um, I, I want to remind everyone of this study that I had mentioned earlier about the from the proceedings of National Academy of Sciences that if you removed all of the animals from US agriculture, I said um, it would have a tiny impact, less than 3% of an impact on climate change. And this is the same study, and it says that it would create a food supply incapable of supporting the US population's nutritional requirements. And when we have this era right now where we have so many people with diet-related illnesses, I would argue that the last thing we should do is be reducing or removing highly nutritious food from the food system. We really need to focus on getting rid of processed foods and beef and other meat are real, whole, extremely nutrient rich foods. That's why they're so important. So I just want to um, briefly mention as part of this, um, we need to be thinking about the fats. So um, humans for, you know, 
centuries, for millennia, we've eaten um, the fat of animals, we've eaten butter, we've eaten, we've drunk whole milk, we've eaten lard, tallow, schmaltz, all kinds of fats from animals. And in recent decades, we have replaced those by industrial vegetable oils, including soy, palm, coconut, corn, rapeseed oil. And as Patrick Holden said a few years ago, I thought this was so brilliant from the Sustainable Food Trust, we are living off the fat of their land now. So we don't use the um, locally produced fats anymore that we could get from our animal herds. We're, um, we're going to Indonesia, we're going to Latin America and producing these other kinds of fats that we think are healthier, but actually are probably in many cases worse for our health. And we're doing sort of untold ecological damage that is out of our sight. And so we don't think about this. I actually um, chaired a whole discussion about this issue at the um, True Cost of American Food Conference a few years ago. And it's a fascinating topic. There's a lot more to say about that, but I'll skip on. Um, so finally, people talk about the limits of carbon sequestration in soils from grazing. And this is a quote from Dr. David Johnson, who's the director of the Institute for Sustainable Agriculture at, in, at New Mexico State University. He says, there is a limit on the amount of carbon that soil will build up, but there is no limit on the amount of soil that can be built. How did we get six feet deep topsoil on our plains? It didn't happen overnight. It happened with the bison. The soil can caption, capture more carbon in the above ground biomass. I just want to end with a few slides of our ranch. We live um, in Northern California. This is our dry season. This is our wet season. We have a Mediterranean climate. And here I am with the cattle, so you know I actually do sometimes do that, <laughs> me again. And um, we also have heritage turkeys, um, which are outdoor raised and go in at night. And finally, um, my overall message is it is not the cow, it is the how. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm open, open for dialogue and questions now. Excellent, thank you so much, Nicolette. That was, that was an incredible sort of march through a lot of facts and, and I think one of the one of the things I really enjoyed about your book was um, uh, the sorting the facts from the fiction and so the, the first chapter in your book I think is called sorting the facts from the fiction and there there does seem to be there's a lot of information out there and um, you know research is often open to interpretation but it does feel as if um, there's there is a certain amount of misinformation and sometimes even disinformation and so it feels, like, it feels like your book is a way of addressing, sort of readdressing the balance there. Um, so I appreciated that. And, and interestingly, you talk about, you know, the way that, um, you know, not all land is suitable for crop production. So we're sitting here in the rolling green hills of Devon. Um, mm -hmm. And we're sort of sandwiched here between the coast, the windy coast and the uplands of Dartmoor. And we're on heavy clay soils, often or silty soils. Um, and so we have steep slopes, heavy soils, high mm -hmm. rainfall. And so traditionally, this area has always been about livestock production uh, on the higher and the hillier places. And then in the, the lowlands, then there would have traditionally been the small scale mixed family farms. And so, yeah. you know, those would have been managed um, on rotational systems. You know, and you talked about cattle being a mobile element of your farming system. And the cattle played a really integral role in maintaining the fertility of those farms. Um, and of course, farming has changed beyond recognition now. Um, but what we're teaching and, and, you know, the sort of the upcoming movement of regenerative agriculture teaches is really about mimicking nature and looking at how ecosystems function and ecosystems function with animals in them. And so when we're creating yes. farming systems, which are mimicking natural ecosystems, including animals in those systems is a really key way to maintain fertility and to actually boost, you know, soil health, soil carbon, biodiversity, and, and all of those things that, that we need to regenerate in our landscapes. And so there's been- Yeah, and I think, I think there are two major points and just to interrupt for just a second, um, if I may, <laughs> uh, I just want to, um, 
point out, I, I had the slide there from Dr. Um, Hunsinger, Lynn Hunsinger, um, about how much of the Earth's um, surface is non-farmable. And she also points out, and you know, others have as well, that that's really where the livestock are in the world. So we often are, you know, sort of heard, you know, there are often these figures bandied about about how much of the Earth's you know, agricultural land is used by livestock and all that stuff. And the truth of the matter is that those, because um, that's really where most of the livestock is, those figures are really misleading because it suggests that you have land that is being used is sort of quote unquote inefficiently by grazing animals. It could in fact be um, producing calories that would be more directly consumable by humans. And this would be a much more efficient process. But it's but that's actually totally wrong because you were just describing Caroline some of the you know the topography around where you are, and that's how it is here as well. We're on a we're right on the Pacific Ocean coast. Um, it's very windy. It's cool. Uh, there's very little moisture except for in the very coldest time of year, and so it's really inhospitable and it's very hilly, very windswept. You know, there, there's just really no way to produce crops here other than um, little pockets, and you can do that. But the rest of the landscape is really only suitable for grazing animals. Um, so that's an incredibly important role that the grazing animals have is sort of um, filling in, you know, um, food production systems around the world where you have that kind of topography. And I thought um, the book uh, by Jared Diamond, Gun, Ger Guns, Germs and Steel, um, I don't know if it was widely read in the UK, but it was a very popular book here in the US. And he talks about how the sort of the human migrations were enabled by having grazing animals with the humans because they could live all over the world as they, you know, they wandered the earth with their grazing animals. And then they could um, basically use inedible vegetation for humans in places where you couldn't even farm at all in order to survive. Mm, absolutely. And of course, there are, you know, there are, um... Uh, communities and cultures all over the world where people moving nomadically with cattle has, has been something that's happened, you know, for, uh, well, thousands of years plus, I imagine. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think another important question to ask, so I love, you know, I love the phrase, it's not the cow, it's the how, because that really is absolutely, it hits the nail on the head, you know, the, it's yeah. very easy to think, okay, well, let's just, let's just not eat animals, because that feels like the simple ethical solution um, but of course mm. it is more nuanced than that and I think the other really important question is to ask if not the cow then what so if mm -hmm. people are not eating meat then exactly what are they eating instead and how is that produced and this is also something you tackle in the book yeah and in fact I had a moment you know you have these moments that kind of stick with you <laughs> and uh Several years ago, um, a man that I'm good friends with, um, that is, his, he's a vegan and he's focused on animal welfare issues and animal rights. And we were traveling together um, to go to a hearing in Oregon, which is you know a state a little north of California. And, um, and we were gonna get, um, testify about an animal welfare bill that was being proposed in in the, the house there and I and he pulled out a snack and I noticed it was and I looked at it I asked him if I could look at it it was a um, you know a, uh, tofu um, I'm trying to remember exactly what it, they called it but it was basically a jerky made from to tofu and um, it was one of those moments where I realized that he was eating you know a highly processed food that had come from undoubtedly a distant venue in terms of where it was farmed and produced. And then it was processed in a, you know, in another location and then it was shipped to him in a packaging. <laughs> and, and, you know, he was feeling that this was a more ethical choice in his food than, you know, something that was based on from animals. And I just thought to myself in that moment, I thought, the food that he's eating is this highly processed food from a distant venue that we don't even know all of the implications and we don't see them and think about them. But I cannot believe that that is touted as something that is healthier or more ethical than eating a piece of meat. Mm, absolutely. And, and soy is a really, you know, it's a hot topic, isn't it, in this conversation? Um, and so, and so uh, you know, of course, we know that there are some ways of raising cattle. Uh, so the sort of the cows on concrete, um, you know, that are being fed uh, soy, you know, which has been grown in uh, 
places that have been recently deforested. Uh, so there's this, there is this kind of narrative around, um, around uh, soy production for cattle. But then, okay. sort of ironically, often um, plant-based diets do include a lot of soy and soy products as well. And I think that there is a little bit of um, perhaps a misunderstanding about uh, the true picture with soy production. Well, exactly. And soy is this massive, um, you know, sort of international crop now that is, you know, farmed in places like Brazil and then shipped to places like Europe and China. And um, it's very easy to, you know, ignore all of the impacts uh, that that's having um, ecologically and in terms of transport emissions and everything else. But it's it's a massive it's it's a massive ecological impact, and uh, in fact, I, I discussed the deforestation of the Amazon in the, in defending beef in some detail, and um, there's there's a very good argument that the cattle that are being put on the Amazonian lands that are being cleared for agricultural purposes are really just being used as a way to gain um, gain title to the land. Essentially, there's a displacement of indigenous peoples, their cattle, again, because they're mobile, you can do this, you sort of put the cattle on there and then you remove them and create soy fields. And that's actually the primary objective. That's the most profitable use of that land. And so where the deforestation is happening in the Amazon, um, the vast majority of it is actually happening to create soy. Now that's another problem in terms of livestock production because it is being used largely for livestock production, but it is also being used for human consumption. And the thing is, if you're eating meat, if you're a meat eater, you can control where you're buying your meat from and what they're eating. So you can choose locally raised grass fed production, but how are you gonna buy your locally produced um, tofu jerky? <laughs> you know, it's not even possible. So. Again, it's just a lot more, you know, the simple answers are not the right answers. Yeah, yeah. And it is interesting that there has been so much focus on farming in terms of, you know, the climate, the climate impacts, um, particularly around emissions, um, where, you know, a disproportionate focus, it seems. And there's, there's been repeatedly, um, you know, calls for eating less meat as being a really big part of the solution to, to climate change. And so there was a few years ago, yeah. there was the Eat Lancet diet, um, which was looking at the kind of diet that we should have um, in order to have a balanced diet and a healthy planet. You know, and, and one of the striking things about that proposal was uh, just how little meat uh, they were recommending. Um, and actually this links a little bit to one of the questions that we have um, that's just popped up. Um, so this is from Ursula and she says, we haven't talked about abundance. One of the things I've been told is that the quantity of cattle we need to feed people is so high that we wouldn't have those ecosystems that are mentioned. Is that true? Can we have enough meat and still raise it in ways that have the advantages you mentioned? So this is a little bit like a question I get asked very often about whether permaculture can feed the world. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I'm happy to address that, but I do want to say something about the Eat Lancet briefly first. Um, that was a very interesting, I, I saw, I think the Guardian covered this or some other, some other UK papers did, so you probably have already seen these articles, but one of the interesting things about that whole initiative was that it was funded mostly by a vegan individual, and she um, came under real criticism because she was also posting pictures of herself jet, jetting around, you know, to vacation spots around the world, <laughs> sometimes in a private jet, I understand, um, and telling people not to eat um, meat because of their concern over their, their carbon footprint. You know, these are some of the absurdities that are happening now. And I mean, you know, social media has its problems, but some of the beauty of it is it also can highlight some of these crazy things that are happening and people are saying and doing at the same time. Okay, the, the hypocrisy of it. Okay, so let's go to the question. Um, so um, the answer is, first of all, I, I just wanna make sure a couple of points are made. One is um, some assumptions that we have. One is we have this assumption that, um, that the amount of meat that we produce is, um, you know, sort of very limited based on how much um, grassland is available, especially the grazing animals and especially beef. But um, first of all, uh, one of the things I think that we should be doing is we should, um, rather than focus so much uh, when we talk about world food systems, you know, on how do we produce X, Y quantity, um, we, we should really think about um, 
what is the sort of sustainable approach to um, grazing animals around the world? And the answer to that is that they should be raised where it makes sense to, to raise them. So there are grasslands around the world um, and that's where those animals should be. They should also be part of mixed farming systems as Caroline was talking about a moment ago. And those would probably be smaller numbers um, that would be rotated in amongst, you know, with um, the, the cultivation of crops. Um, and, and that should sort of be how we should figure out the right number for the globe. But what doesn't make any sense is to say, um, there's this purported, you know, X environmental impact from um, from raising cattle, and therefore we need to, you know, reduce it by X amount to try to cap that, because when you look at environmental impact of any um, any kind of farming system, it is extremely hyper locally specific, and how you're raising it, you know, it's the how, not the cow. Um, it, um, how you're raising it, where you're raising it, you know, that has a dramatic effect on what the what the um, number is, you know, what the whatever you're measuring. Um, so uh, a few years ago, the Savory Institute here in, um, which is based in um, Colorado in the United States, um, and they advocate for and they work with grazing um, um, people around the world to improve grazing practices. They calculated that in the United States, because this is said of the U.S. all the time, we couldn't have, you know, all the beef if we did it um, on grass versus having um, grain finished beef and so forth and having feedlots. What they did is they 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 looked at available grazing land and they looked at how much you could improve the grazing, um, how much you could produce off of that land with improved grazing practices. And they showed that actually it's totally the wrong question. The real question is not, again, it's about the how, um, because um, the amount of animal um, you know, unit, how much meat, how much milk, everything you can produce off of land is dramatically affected by how well you're grazing it and so, or how well you're managing it. And so they showed that if you used good grazing practices um, in the US, you could actually produce all of the beef in the United States and have a 30% surplus of land still left over. You, you wouldn't need, in other words, people are looking at the conventional system and saying, well, you couldn't do it because there's not enough land but they're assuming continuation of current practices. So this is why I'm always saying you're sort of asking the wrong question when, you, not you personally, the person who just asked the question, but people are asked the wrong question when they ask about how much you can produce. Because the real energy, in my view, should be on how we're grazing. Because we can um, not just create much more nutrient dense food through good grazing practices, but we can dramatically increase productivity. Um, off of that land. And so, and that's been demonstrated all over the world. In fact, the Savory Institute does a wonderful job of showing places around the world where they have worked, where they have actually returned um, not just vegetation to the land, but even water courses by grazing. You know, we're told constantly that if you have animals, it's going to destroy the environment. They've actually shown that they've returned water to land, not just subsoil, not just the subterranean water that I was talking about, but even surface water that had totally disappeared was returned. And the reason is because there's so much biological health to the soil that is returned that the whole hydrological cycle begins to be revitalized. And so it has all these cascading positive effects. So I really don't think, and, and to answer the question more directly um, in my first book, Righteous Pork Chop, I looked, um, looked at a number of studies that had been done on sort of trying to quantify how much meat could be produced if you went to totally grass-based and or organic systems. And this has been done several times by different organizations and it has been shown that essentially you could raise um, ample uh, meat for the entire world population if you shifted to these types of practices. So I don't really think that, I think actually that's kind of a red herring. I don't actually think that's a real problem. Mm. And, and um, you know, it, as you say, you know, it, everything, um, all of the solutions that we might find to these, to these problems are always very context, uh, context dependent, context appropriate. And that's exactly. another thing that we have to relearn, I think, because I think that the Green Revolution, the ironically named Green Revolution, mm -hmm. um, has enabled us to, to farm beyond nature's limits, you know, and to farm mm -hmm. in context, you know, to grow wheat in context. We never would have been able to grow wheat in before. And we're having to relearn so much about how to farm within those, within those ecosystem boundaries again. And so some people are calling it the fourth agricultural revolution. You know, what's happening now with the sort of, 
regenerative agriculture. I think it's almost more of a renaissance because it's going to be a return of creativity and knowledge intensive farming again. And so, you know, the, the reason that we've developed the, the BSc in regenerative food and farming here at Dartington and Schumacher is because, you know, that knowledge about how and how to farm within nature's limits and in context appropriate ways has been lost, you know, in the last couple of generations. And so we're having to, to bring that back and, and to go forward by design, you know, that's, that's another key thing, I think. Yeah, so I think it's a combination of um, rediscovering traditional knowledge and practices and recognizing nature's wisdom and limits and understanding those. And then um, embracing a lot of the new knowledge that has, for example, um, how soil biology actually works and really um, working with that new knowledge. And so, um, my husband, Bill Nyman, who's a well-known um, person in the, in the U.S. and food and farming, he, he used to always say, I think we should turn back the clock to agriculture from about you know, 50 years ago. And I kept saying, don't use that phrase because <laughs> we're not turning back the clock. We're really going forward in a very different way. But we're rediscovering and reclaiming some of that traditional knowledge because there was a lot of traditional knowledge because people had those natural limits before, you know, the chemicals and so forth and the machinery and everything else that enabled the Green Revolution to happen, in quotes. Um, because, um, you know, we had to live within those boundaries until very, very recently. And um, there was a kind of a hubris that came out of all the technology where we started thinking, we don't have to pay attention to nature's boundaries. We can basically do whatever we want, wherever we want. And that is that has been proven completely false. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we're um, looking for in the regenerative agriculture movement is sort of the combination of traditional knowledge and new new knowledge, tra traditional wisdom and new science. Absolutely. And we've learned so much. I mean, a lot of the soil science that you referred to in your talk, you know, that's within the last 20 to 30 years that we've understood, you know, the work of people like Dr. Elaine Ingham and Dr. Christine Jones, you know, has has just shifted our understanding, you know, so dramatically. So we've got a huge amount of knowledge to take forward into that next, you know, the next iteration of what, what agriculture looks like. Um, so I'm just going to have a quick look and see if we've got some more questions. Um, okay, so there's one here about, about misinformation. So Louise says, misinformation is a powerful public opinion influencer which could eventually influence government policies. How can this issue be effectively addressed so that the public can make informed choices? Is there an impartial, um, authoritative body capable of measuring and labeling food in relation to its effects on climate change without being too complex, a scale of one to five, say? So that's interesting because that immediately brings to mind for me the work of the Sustainable Food Trust. I don't well, I think, I mean, there are really good, credible groups around the world in different locations that are doing really good work, such as the Sustainable Food Trust that does their true cost accounting. And um, as I mentioned before, I was, I chaired a panel on the um, American version that they did of that conference, the true cost accounting com conference that they did in the US and San Francisco. And we looked specifically at fats. But I think that, you know, it's it's very important to, to look at the sources of information because there are so many vested interests and people obviously will look at me and say, well, you know, you raise cattle and that is true. I mean, obviously that has to be taken into account, but I was a biologist before I was raising cattle and I was an environmental lawyer before I was raising cattle. And I bring all of those um, backgrounds to the table when I speak. But I think, um, I do think that um, the Food and Agriculture Organization has done some good work. I mean, there is very good work being done. I think it's the most important thing to me is not to listen to a particular advocacy group that is, you know, has a very specific agenda. And especially when it comes to meat, it's a very emotional topic. People are, you know, very, very strong, feel, have very strong feelings about it. That isn't wrong, but it does affect their credibility and their ability to accept other facts that don't support their narrative. And so, you know, when I look at, um, you know, the PETA website, like the one I show the people for ethical treatment of animals, or um, other vegan advocacy, advocacy groups, the information that's on there about food and farming is just not credible. It's not scientifically based, it is not balanced. And it certainly um, doesn't give any kind of picture of what a world food system would look like, or even a national food system or a local food system would look like in terms that would really be ecologically vibrant and sustainable and have no animals in it. 
they 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 don't have um, a proposal for that because it really um, it doesn't really exist. Um, the animals play an incredibly important and unique role. And if you're, you know, ethically determined not to eat animals, I think that's a perfectly respectable choice as an individual, but it is not a sensible strategy for creating a global or national ecologically vibrant food system. Mm. And on, on that front, I also, you know, I, I enjoyed the section that you, where you were writing about um, rancher children. And you're talking about, uh, you know, farming kids, basically kids who are raised on farms and, and the relationship that they have with nature and with animals. And therefore, the way in which they're able to sort of process and respond to life and death, you know, and, and, and for so many of us now, obviously yes. we are very much removed from the natural world and we're removed from that, you know, being confronted with the process of life and death. And therefore, I guess we've become very sensitized to it. Yeah, actually, um, it's interesting because when I wrote the book, Defending Beef, the first book, I wasn't sure whether to include that section in there. And in fact, my editor even said, I'm not sure we should have this in here. <laughs> and I kind of said, the more I thought about it, I said, no, I really want to make this argument. And it's been the, um, the, the, the chapter of the book that I've gotten the most positive and strongest feedback about. So I think it has really resonated with a lot of people. Basically, I, um, I saw this even before having children of my own. Um, we would visit farms and ranches around. My husband and I have been to hundreds of farms and ranches probably over. He's been to hundreds for sure. I've probably been to scores, maybe not hundreds, but many, many farms and ranches around in the U.S. and, and around the world. And what I saw over and again was the children that were growing up on these places were really different than the kids I was encountering elsewhere. Um, there was a level of just sort of knowledge and comfort about, you know, the way nature works, the way all of us, um, you know, sort of are born and grow and get sick and older and die. And that just sort of that whole cycle of life, it was just something that I um, saw again and again in conversations I was having with children and with the parents on these farms and ranches. And then I had my own children starting 12 years ago, I had my um, older son and then another son a few years later. And um, it's not just about the animals that we're raising, but they're outside kind of in an ecosystem, you know, a natural ecosystem for much of the day, every single day. And so they see you know, baby owls that have not successfully fledged. They see, you know, the swallows, we have tons of swallows. Um, you know, they're, they're, we're just surrounded by the herons and the egrets and the eagles and the, uh, the hawks and all kinds of insect life and the rabbits. And I mean, just, it's just an endless list of, of all of the animals that we're surrounded by. And so they witness the hunting and the injuries and the dying and the birth. And, you know, it's just part of the daily experience. And I cannot say enough about how, um, how, how, um, sort of significant, I believe that has been in their upbringing. And I really do believe it will help prepare them to just be more resilient in life and to face the, the loss of their own parents, which will inevitably come at one point and other people that they love, and then ultimately themselves. And so it's part of what worries me about the loss of connectedness between humans you know, modern um, sort of um, urbanized humans and the natural world. And it's part of what I think is so beautiful and important and worth preserving in agriculture and having people that can live on the land. And one of the things about animals is they make farms in general, um, not always, but in general, more economically viable. So it's part of what makes it possible for families to live on the land. And then also it's just, um, you know, from my own perspective and having talked to a lot of people who have diverse farms with lots of different things, the animals are their favorite part of what they do because interacting with the animals on a daily basis and learning from them you know, I always talk about how I, the, the cow mothers here are so inspiring to me. <laughs> and I mean that in the most sincere way. I'm not saying that as hyperbole or anything. Um, they are just uh, fierce and loving and devoted. And it's just, you know, gives me energy every time I'm feeling a little beaten down from the, you know, the burdens of motherhood, you know, but um, it's a daily interaction that we cherish and that I think it's part of what makes, 
um, the raising of livestock so important for people around the world is that that connectedness and that learning that goes in both directions. And so um, it's one of the aspects about that I really believe that we should have animals in the food system. Mm, I can absolutely relate to that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nicolette. There, there are more questions. I'm aware that there's, there are questions that we haven't had time to answer. Um, but I would, I would very much recommend Nicolette's book. It's, it's incredibly comprehensive and detailed and thorough. Um, so here's the, here's the cover here, Defending Beef. Um, so if you'd like to know more and if you, if you want you know, really solid answers uh, to some of these really tricky questions, um, then, then do uh, have a look at the book. So thank you, Nicolette. That was really interesting and, uh, and inspiring. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you so much for inviting me. So um, tonight's talk was a free event, but if you would like to donate to support the authors and also the Schumacher College programs, um, there will be a link in the chat uh, where you can make a donation and we'd be very grateful. If you'd like more information about the BSC Regenerative Food and Farming and the MSC Regenerative Food and Farming Enterprise, which are due to open um, soon at Schumacher College, again, you can find information on the website and there will be a link in the chat. Um, so uh, thanks, for, thanks to Chelsea Green for co-hosting this event with us. There will be another talk in the Farming for the Future series at the end of next month with Jesse Frost, uh, author of the Living Soil Handbook. So hope you can join us then. And thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks, everybody. Good night.